Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Investing from A to Z podcast. I'm your host, Steph Bodrini. We provide straightforward information by bringing excellent guests with real world experience in all topics related to commercial real estate investing. And in today's episode, we are discussing what are some of the major things you should think about when reviewing an industrial lease. We are chatting with Chad Griffiths. He is an industrial investor and expert. He has been a broker for several years and an investor over the last few years, and he will share his knowledge with us. Here we go. Chad, thank you so much for joining us again. I cannot believe it's been a few months since we last spoke already. Feels like two weeks ago. <laughs> That's crazy so how fast. Yeah, so the, the year's just going by so quick, isn't it? Yes, it's crazy. Another year so fast. <laughs> yep. um, but first, why don't you please uh, remind our audience what you focus on and uh, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, thanks for that. And a pleasure to be on the show. Uh, I started in industrial real estate in 2005. I started as a broker. And after about eight or nine years of being a broker, I started investing myself. So in 2014, a partner and I started buying industrial properties. And we've pretty much been buying one a year since. And we've got a, a large property under contract right now that we're just going through due diligence with as well. So we started with a real small industrial condominium. And uh, since then, we've been buying larger properties. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Today, I would love to focus on industrial leases. I think it'll be very beneficial. It's a very popular topic, as you know, industrial uh, asset class is very hot and a lot of people want to learn more about it. It's always one of our top played episodes. Why don't we maybe go page by page on your lease and you can talk about things to watch out for, what to be careful with. What are some things you could potentially give and take from potential tenants? I think that would be awesome. Yeah, a great uh, entrance into the to the space because the lease is the governing document that organizes and controls that arrangement between the lease or in the leasee for the term of the lease. So I don't necessarily want to get into the deep weeds of it because there's a lot of legal nuance that gets put into a, a lease. And depending on whether it's a strong landlord or a strong tenant will determine how that lease is favored. Uh, an example might be Amazon going and negotiating a, a lease with a local company, Amazon is going to heavily influence that lease process. Whereas if it's a large company like Prologis and it's a small local tenant, then Prologis is going to have a lot of influence over that, the what content of that lease. But I think what, what would, perhaps we could cover is just some of the key things that people want to be aware of. That at the very basics, a lease is going to, is going to spell out who the tenant is, who the landlord is, who the parties are, size of the space, when it commences, how long of a lease term it is, what the lease rate is going to be. And that can be a fixed rate for the duration of the lease, or it can be a lease that has predetermined escalations in it. So let's just use a quick 10-year lease as an example. It might start at $10 a square foot and go to $15 a square foot by the end of the term. What we're actually seeing quite common right now is a rent increase tied to some percentage. So it could be tied to CPI or it can just be a percentage that's put in. I just did a lease actually uh, late last week and it started at 850 a square foot and had two and a half percent yearly uh, escalations for a five-year term. So we're starting to see that pretty common as well. I'd say once you start getting beyond the obvious terms of, of what's in the lease, who the parties are, how long it's going to go for, what the rent is, then you're going to start getting into uh, provisions that deal with the operating costs or the additional rent as it's sometimes called. So for those uh, just needing a quick refresher on it, leases are going to be structured. The majority of leases are going to be structured. I should preface uh, that they're triple net leases. So you'll have one lease that will say that this is the base amount that they pay. So again, that's the contract rent that they pay, base rent or net rent. And then the tenants also pay for their proportionate share of all the operating level expenses of the building. So that's property taxes, building insurance, common area maintenance, management fees. And that's always going to be an estimate. So the landlord will give the tenant an estimate on what it's going to be 
in advance. And then after all the year, all the bills come in every year, then they reconcile it. They either give the tenant a credit uh, if they charge too much or they invoice if there was not enough paid throughout the course of the year. That language is probably the most important thing uh, in my mind as a property owner myself is you want to have it very clear that the, that any increases in those expenses can get passed through to the tenant. If it's if that late language is vague or not very clearly explained, and it becomes contentious, it might not be a big deal if it's a small lease, like if it's a five thousand square foot lease, and that discrepancies a few thousand dollars, it might not be worth making an issue of. But it, you can imagine some of these big distribution centers are approaching a million square feet. If there's a small discrepancy in between how the landlord expected it to be and then what the tenant interpreted it at, that can be tens, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. So I would say that when you're working through a lease, whether it's through the eyes of a tenant or the eyes of the property owner, it's imperative that that language surrounding the a handling of property level expenses. And again, that's usually called operating costs or additional rent. The terminology varies all across North America. Like I've, I've heard people call triple net, double net, single net, fully net, almost anything you can imagine. But it's all basically relying on the same premise is that the tenants pay for their proportionate level of expenses and any increases. So that can be worded in like an indefinite amount of ways. You start inv involving uh, different lawyers and some big companies will have an internal legal department and they'll also have outside counsel. You start involving multiple lawyers and agreeing to that term. It can become very nuanced or it can be very straightforward. But whatever, wh whatever side of the table you're on, you just want to make sure you've got a clear understanding of how those expenses are handled. Uh, another one that I think is also really important are any options that a, it's usually going to be a tenant option that they have the unilateral ability to exercise. The most common one is a right to renew. What what I always remind people of is that that is a that's a tenant benefit. Having an option to renew is solely for the tenant, because if the landlord looks at it through the lens of yes, you always want your tenants to renew, but that could prohibit you from expanding a neighboring tenant. It could prohibit uh, selling the building. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons on how an option to renew can actually be a detriment to the landlord. So look at that as a tenant inducement. Given an option to renew is a tenant inducement that you're giving them. It can be treated differently as a tenant improvement allowance or free rent or, or any other inducement, but it's still an inducement nonetheless. It's a tenant favored option to renew. So look to see if there are any, uh, any options and look to see what the language is on that. I've seen leases that were structured that there's an option to renew at a predetermined amount. So it could be going back to that example of the lease I just did last week. If Let's just say hypothetically that both parties agreed that it's a five-year lease at 850 a square foot escalating at some amount. They could in theory agree to fix the renewal rate. So, and this happens in with tenants that have a lot of influence is they'll say the renewal rate shall be no higher than X. So in that scenario, it might be the renewal rate might be no higher than 950 a square foot. And that's, that's fine if both of those parties agree to it. But if that landlord then goes and sells that property and a new owner comes in thinking that they can raise the rates to market, they might be handcuffed if there is actually a, a ceiling on what they can raise it. Most commonly the, what, what I've seen the majority of the time is that leases will say, uh, the the lease rate will be at market. The lease rate renewal will be at market. If both parties can't come to some uh, understanding, then it'll go to arbitration. It's very rare that it gets to that level, but that's just one thing to be aware of. So, sir, like that, that's probably the most overlooked thing that uh, that investors, when they're looking at properties, the most overlooked thing that they uh, tend to neglect. Options to renew. Is there an option to purchase in there? Is there a right of first refusal uh, if another tenant wants to take the neighboring space or if they uh, if there's a right of first refusal that they get an, the, the chance to buy the property if another buyer comes forward? That language often isn't prevalent. It's not on the first page of the lease like you'd see the size and the lease rate and the term. That's usually buried deeper in the lease, but th those can have incredibly powerful implications if they're not caught.
So one, one thing that I always advise, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but, but I'm fairly experienced uh, as both a broker and an investor. I would never get into a deal without having my lawyer look at, at a document, even though I've got a pretty good degree of comfort having looked at many, many leases. I'd never uh, do a, a deal myself without having my lawyer vet it. And that's a recommendation that I make to everybody as well is you you can read through it and it's good for you to read through it, but you also want your lawyer catching anything that you might have just missed. And depending on how big the deal is or the lease or the tenant, have another lawyer review that because I have heard I was just reading Confessions of a Real Estate Entrepreneur book, which is a phenomenal commercial book. book. And he is a lawyer himself. And he admitted that he missed something on some bank documents for his client and his client found it. And his client made sure that whatever wording had to be changed. So even an experienced person and lawyer with many years of experience, he might not be thinking from an investor's perspective, or there is one little thing that he might not catch, right? So if it's a big deal, you should have a backup lawyer, in my opinion. Absolutely. I don't think that it's ever wrong having too many eyes on it. Uh, like the bank, banker's probably going to look at it. Uh, the appraiser might look at the lease to see if there's anything in there. But at the very least, you want to be going through it diligently yourself and then yeah. have your lawyer. Like I, I think a lawyer is is absolutely fundamental uh, to have on a deal. And, and although they can compromise some deals, I mean, there's always that saying that lawyers kill deals. Uh, I, 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 I are on the side that if, if they're killing deals, that's, they probably should have killed the deal. There's probably something that wasn't uh, above par on there, or there was that term. There could have been that right of first refusal that nobody else caught. So is it, at the risk that a lawyer might jeopardize a deal, I think that the benefit that they bring far exceeds that risk. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And like you were saying, you yourself should always read all of the documents. And that's another thing that he covered in that book, that somebody went bankrupt because of uh, one technicality on one of his um, developments that he did not read and he let his lawyer uh, read because it was, I don't know, 100 page or something like that. So I just uh, I just did a lease uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago and it was 80 pages. It was an yeah. 80 page lease uh, and it was so dense with legal legal terminology but you're right. If if you're not reading it, I, I think it's always got to be going going through it as like a partnership with the lawyer, saying like, yeah. "Here's here's the things that I'm concerned about." The lawyer is going to point out things that they should be concerned about, and just view it as it's the two parties, the buyer or seller, and the lawyer going through that document and identifying areas of risk or areas that should just be noteworthy. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for confirming and re- reiterating that. And I also want to also highlight a couple of things that you mentioned on making sure that when your expenses increase, that whoever the tenant is, they're also going to be responsible for that increase. I have highlighted this many times, but it's worth highlighting and say it really is ingrained in everybody's mind with regards to taxes. So when somebody buys a new property in some states, at least here in the U.S., the old taxes are not based on the uh, current assessed value. They're based on what the owner had purchased many years ago with a very small increase. And so that's going to be a huge difference. And if that is not in the lease on the triple net that the tenant will pay for this new tax increase, that can be a deal breaker. And also making sure that that tenant can afford this increase before you buy this property. Really, really, really important. And that varies by state. In California, that is the the case, for example. Another thing I'm curious about with the inflation going on right now is two and a half really (laughs) a good increase every year. And I know some leases are every five years. How do you prevent that? when high inflation is happening right now. Yeah, and that is the topic of the day is we're, I think it was 8.3% in the US, the the latest CPI numbers. And that follows a series of of increases that were all in around that 8% range. So it it is a, a topic that's very on the mind of landlords right now. And in some ultra hot markets, they're not even committing to longer term leases because they think that they can get more upside by doing shorter, call it like a one to three year lease 
and then realizing that after three years, they can get much bigger of of an increase. It would be difficult going to a company uh, like Amazon, uh, as an example, and saying your rent starts at ten dollars a square foot, but we're going to have eight uh, percent increases in there every year. That that's going to be tough for them to agree to, and and I suspect that there will be landlords out there that that will just say we'd love to have that covenant. We don't think inflation is going to be eight percent for the next three years. It might be that for the next several months, but it sh- it should normalize. I, I mean, if it doesn't normalize, I think the the trade-off is that the the feds are just going to keep raising interest rates. So I, I think that there's a, a solid commitment at that fed fed level that has gone from saying there isn't any inflation to the inflation's transitory to inflation is temporary to inflation is finally here to, we, we don't have any control over inflation. I think that they're yeah. now realizing that they have to keep uh, the pressure on this to avoid having like several months more of this high inflation. So I think interest rates are going to keep, increasing until those numbers normalize so i don't think that there's many landlords out there that are that are saying let's ask for eight percent increases in line with cpi as much as they're just saying that this should normalize but the trade-off is that some landlords are just saying we'll take a a short-term deal right now uh and we'll look to see what the lease rates are in a couple of years in my mind there's always that trade-off do you want to have the risk that in two or three years that perhaps the economy softens and we go into a deeper recession than anybody expects. And then you're in a position where you might lose your tenant to another building versus having that ability to realize upside potential. I Mm -hmm. steer more on the side of, I like the stability of knowing that I've got tenants that are going to be in there for some amount of time. And if I leave a little bit on the table, then that's, that's the price of having peace of mind that the tenants are going to be there. Some landlords, especially institutional landlords, they might not take that same approach because it doesn't hit their pocketbook the same way if they lose a a big tenant as it would for me. Everybody's going to approach it somewhat differently. Yeah. Whatever is important to you. Exactly. This is awesome, Chad. Is there anything else with regards to leases, industrial leases that people should really be mindful of for their investments? I, I think just going back to that original point, just make sure that you understand all the the little details. Uh, even insurance could be another one that becomes uh, a little bit more contentious. It varies market to market, but it used to be common uh, in my market that it was tenants had to have $2 million worth of insurance. And now almost every landlord has increased that to $5 million of insurance. And there'll be markets where I'm sure it's even higher for where prices are higher. But just making making sure that 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 insurance provision is correct. You're involving your insurance agent or whoever you're using that, but it's a lease really should be viewed as a document where a number of people have input into it. Uh, and the accountant might want to have input onto how some of these costs are handled. Your lawyer definitely needs to be involved in it. Your insurance broker is another one. I, th- I think so long as you're looking at this document, it's it's governing a long term relationship. I've always. <laughs> somewhat facetiously said that uh, some commercial industrial leases last longer than a marriage. Uh, and these parties are are in this relationship together. Uh, but if they don't really understand what that relationship says, if the lease just goes according to plan and the tenants pay their rent through the whole duration of the lease and there's no problems with it, that document will sit in a file uh, on your computer and you'll never even think about it. Where that lease becomes so important is if there is a problem. That's how I approach it from a a property owner level is I want to be prepared and confident that 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 document is going to uh, prevail in the sense if something does go wrong. You're always hoping that nothing does go wrong, but that's why we have insurance. That's why you have a lease. What happens if the tenant stops paying rent? What are your rights of remedy? Uh, there's, There's all sorts of things that have to go in there if something goes wrong. And that's that's perhaps one way to look at that document is the emergency guide on what you can do if something bad happens. If the lease goes according to plan, you know what your rent is. You know that the, they're paying for any increases. You know that, uh, that they're staying for some amount of time. If they have an option to renew, there's language on when they have to give you notice. That's fine. You know all of that. And if the lease goes according to plan, you'll maybe never look at that lease again. 
But as soon as something goes wrong, there's a fire in the building, or we run into an uh, an epidemic where some tenants are forced to close down. Well, what what happens in those scenarios? And if you look at it from that emergency break glass, if emergency type of situation, and you have to dive into that lease, you just want to make sure that it's not silent on some of these topics. Because if it is silent and it goes before a court, you're at the mercy of either either the judge or whoever's going to make the decision on it. So I, that's how I view it, is just making sure you're protected. If something goes wrong, you know, kind of knock on wood figuratively that nothing does go wrong, but things do. It happens. It's It's business. Exactly. Well, Chad, thank you so much for coming back and sharing your wisdom with us. I really appreciate it. How can our listeners get in touch with you? Uh, well, I love talking about this stuff. So I've got a, a YouTube channel where I just talk about industrial real estate. So if they just uh, go and check that out, that's uh, probably the best. Uh, or I'm active on LinkedIn as well. So either YouTube or LinkedIn would be great. What is the name of your YouTube channel? It's just my uh, first last name, Chad Griffiths, uh, C-R-E. But if you just search industrial real estate on YouTube, I've, I've got a lot of content out there. So I'm sure you'll stumble across one of my videos. And we'll make sure to put that on their show notes. Thank you so much, Chad. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, great discussion, Steph. Thanks again for having me on. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter and join our Real Estate Investment Club. We will be sending our future syndications there. And I would love to thank one of our latest reviewers, Dr. Jinunk one of the most amazing podcasts. Thank you so much for putting an amazing real estate podcast together. Very informative, very easy to listen. I've learned so much and so wonderful to see a strong woman like you doing a phenomenal job. Can't wait to meet you in person, hopefully one day soon. Sounds great, doctor. Thank you so much for making the time for writing this review. I really, really appreciate it. And I will see you next time.